our webinar uh, participants uh, today for this workshop, 9 to 11. Um, feel free for people here to grab uh, coffee and uh, fruit over here. There's some handouts um, uh, handouts at the back. Uh, I want to thank um, the Mac Foundation and Johnson Controls. Uh, Trish and her colleague are here. Um, they know Johnson Controls from uh, performance contracts and work. So, um, happy to have them uh, support these monthly workshops. Uh, our next workshop is April. Uh, let's see, what is it? April. Third? The first on Wednesday. Oh, I, I didn't write it down. But fifth, April fifth. So parks, trails, and um, uh, nature play. So that will be uh, here again, uh, and, and the agenda will come out uh, hopefully a little sooner in a couple of weeks. Um, so um, I want to just do a quick. I have four uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, uh, just sort of sort of the cliff notes of uh, water conservation and reuse. So. If we can jump to my, oh, my little PowerPoint. Yes. Oh, yes, okay. So um, so I don't know if anyone has found this uh, feature, which has been here for a, a, a few months, but if you if you go to any page on the Green Subsidies website and click on Best Practices, there's a little filter function. Show me all. A little pointer. Okay, so anyway, so uh, as you can see there in the upper right, show me all actions, best practice actions related to, and I've selected water conservation here, and then what gets displayed are 18 um, uh, actions organized, um, as always, according to sort of what the category of best practices. So we have um, uh, uh, buildings and lighting, obviously, uh, land use, uh, environmental management, and businesses. So. You know, depending on your city, you obviously have uh, or may be working with uh, a subset of your community. You're working on a particular project. And so best practices related to and ways that you can uh, accelerate water conservation and reuse are going to be in these different uh, areas. So just uh, do them. Ah. So, under the, so here are the ones uh, under building. So action 1, 1.1, 1 1.7. This would be uh, public buildings. Obviously, cities control their own um, benchmarking uh, and can do the green water harvesting action. Action number two is 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 what's happening uh, in the private sector, residential water conservation. Uh, we, use, um, we do have, as as we do in a few uh, best practices throughout Green Step, we give cities uh, a chance to highlight sort of really interesting actions are completed by businesses. Perhaps the city has not had a role in it, but we feel like since the Green Subsidies website and, and the report of actions is so public, it, it gives everyone, city council members, uh, community members, businesses, chamber of commerce, a chance to see, well, what is what a business is done? So that's an action there, uh, highlighting water conservation and business building. Um, new buildings, uh, action 3.5, this is new buildings. Um, cities have uh, a role and can uh, place constraints or freedom uh, in terms of um, uh, like condo, co-op, um, um, uh, guidelines. So for example, well in Minnesota most uh, new residential units are organized uh, by some sort of resident, um, homeowners association and sometimes those homeowner, homeowner associations um, place a prohibition on uh, more permeable uh, uh, less, you know, water, uh, greasy landscaping. So you might have a condo association that says only, only grass, and you might have two acres of grass around the condo. Uh, cities can step in and say, you know, no for sort of, uh, you know, our sort of environmental, uh, sort of ecologic function in the city. Um, we that condo association may not uh, place that prohibition, and so in fact, those people who own condo. Uh, Condos and are working together I would put in might put in different landscapes. So that's just a, a somewhat unusual action. Um, looking here under the environmental management um, actions, uh, best practices, uh, city purchases, incentives, standards, park system, um, uh, landscaping, drinking water system. Uh, as cities work, it could be for some cities uh, work closely with their businesses and their opportunities to. Uh, that sort of assistance with cities uh, 
or in uh, licensees uh, standards at the permit window. There could be a lot of conservation information for uh, businesses, residents who come up uh, for a permit. Uh, obviously, demand side rate stuff. Um, and then in, in, uh, in smaller um, areas on septics, um, uh, sometimes gray water systems, but especially composting toilets can be, in fact, very much more cost effective. Um, and finally, um, in, uh, in the economic development uh, efforts, some cities with a strong economic development um, person or staff working with the chamber uh, may want to work, uh, uh, especially uh, thinking about, we were thinking about uh, wastewater discharge, reuse of that up in, uh, in Grand Rapids work between uh, hot water coming from the bland and paper mill and the, well in this case it's just really transferring energy from the bland and paper mill to the library, but this was one of these projects where the city and being in touch with its businesses realized there was great advantage to both the, uh, the business and the, uh, and the library. And in this case, reusing uh, wastewater uh, discharge and the heat, but there are, there are places where, you, where water can supplant drinking water for um, non-contact living water. So that's, um, that's a quick sort of again, cliff notes, and I think uh, we'll just move on to uh, Carmelita Nelson from the Department of Natural Resources. Carmelita yeah, is working full time and has for just a few years. Three started my third year. Third year. So this is a very special. We're really we're really thrilled that the DNR has made water conservation uh, such a focus, and she's coming in at the time when cities have a regulatory requirement. But she'll talk about um, those water plans, but also water conservation. On the user, so. Could you try maybe pressing the little button on the back? I'm not sure that this. <laughs> and I, do I point it at that thing? Or? Where am I supposed to point it? Um, <laughs> okay, well, it doesn't work. Okay, all okay, right, well. And, <laughs> sorry, so, do you think I point it up there? Um, it's, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so, welcome. How many of you are with uh, cities in particular? Good. I'm going to be targeting you after a little bit uh, to get some of your feedback and input. So I'm Carmelita Nelson, and I'm with the Department of Natural Resources, and as Phil mentioned, it's a brand new position. It was never in existence before, um, but the Department of Natural Resources has made it a priority that water conservation in the state of Minnesota is a, a top priority, and we are putting additional funding towards water conservation, education, and promotion, I think. So I'll start out with, see if I can get this next go. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm trying not to stand in your way. Um, I'm pretty sure I can probably almost see over me. But <laughs> everybody hear me okay? Dave, you can hear me in the back? Okay. My earliest job was as a naturalist, so I got pretty good at projecting long distances in small places. So. Um, well, I'll talk about the purpose of the water supply plan that we're currently doing. I'll get into the demand reduction measures that are required by law. And then we'll talk about some of our future conservation efforts that we're working on. So the water supply plans um, are due to all cities that are over 300, that serve over 1,000 people are required to do a water supply plan every 10 years. So we are now in our third generation of these water supply plans. Um, so we are, rather than having all 360 do them at one time and sort of overloading our field staff, we're doing about 120 cities per year. And so these cities will do their water supply plan. It was originally called the Emergency Preparedness and Water Conservation Plan or something. We just shortened it down to water supply plan. It focuses just on quantity. We don't get into the uh, water quality issues and things like that. So it's more with the Department of Health, although we do work closely with them with their wellhead protection plan. Um, and in the metro area, all cities, even if you serve less than 1,000, still have to do it as part of the Net Council Comprehensive Law comprehensive plan. There's four parts to the template. Um, we, we provide a template. We're trying this year to really encourage cities to do the plans themselves, not to hire consultants. We're not prohibiting them from doing that, but we try to make it easy enough that any water supplier can do it. And so we made like a, like a lot of check boxes to fill in the blanks so they don't have to write the plan, they just sort of fill in the information. And so there's four parts. One is the basic inventory of their water supply system. Um, and then this is not part of the auditors. I don't know if, how many of you have seen this auditors transparency tool, state auditors transparency. If you haven't gone online to see that, it is so awesome. 
the reason the state auditor did this was to find out how much money are we going to be having to spend on infrastructure in sewer and water systems in the state of Minnesota in the next couple of decades. So they inventoried every water supply system in the state. And by age category, how big the system is, are the, are the pipes and things over 50 years old, less than 50 years old. So far they've done the um, storm or the wastewater, and I think they're going to be rolling out the um, water supply here this spring. Does anybody know for sure? I've, I've heard it's going to be rolling out this spring, but it's just the most amazing tool. So um, this doesn't replace that, but it hopefully will complement that. Then emergency planning is another really big thing that we are promoting that the cities be prepared. You may have heard about Blaine running out of water. We want to make sure that people are ready for whenever there's a water situation. And that, that goes back historically for 30 years. And then the, the fourth part is, or third part is water conservation. And this is a piece that's probably changed the most from 10 years ago. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. And then the fourth piece is the metropolitan area has a little bit more requirements that they have to provide data for than the outstate city. So what's the use, I mean, other than it being required by law, why should cities want to do this? I mean, what's, what's the use of it? So it helps them to prepare for um, drought and water emergencies. The big hook that we give to the cities is if um, they want to apply for any Department of Health funding, they need to have a water supply plan approved. And people may think, cities may think, well, DNR doesn't talk to the Department of Health. We won't worry about that little detail. Believe it or not, they call me and they say, does this city, this city, this city have their approved water supply plan? And if I say no, that city goes to the bottom of the list and they can't get funding until they have this plan finished. So it really behooves them to finish the plan now and they're good for the next 10 years for funding. So um, that's kind of a, a good hope that we have there. Um, and then if they want to get a new well or expand their well capacity, um, DNR also requires them to have an approved water supply plan. And um, it also fulfills part of the wellhead protection plan with the Department of Health. They have to have a contingency plan in there, and so our plan fulfills the Department of Health's requirement. And then it also fulfills the new demand reduction law um, that went into the plan. So there's 360 uh, water suppliers that we do. Most of these are cities. There's a few of them that are prisons, a few that are college campuses. Those are the main, oh, maybe some big mobile home parks. But for the most part, they are cities. So um, those are the ones I'm actually going out and talking to all 360 cities. Um, if anyone's interested in attending any of these training workshops, I do have a flyer in the back of the room with all the 14 workshops that are scheduled starting in mid-March. Um, so what's new with the water supply plan from 10 years ago? Uh, we have much stronger water conservation measures. It's a lot easier to complete. And we've gone electronic 10 years ago. Everybody turned in paper copies. So, uh, it's all now electronic in our state reporting system. Um, and we're meeting, in the past we just sent out letters and told them you must do this. And we're actually this time meeting with the cities, talking about them, why these the plans are important and what they can learn about. And also, um, it fulfills the requirement of the Metropolitan Council part of the plan. So that actually, the Metropolitan part isn't due until 2018, but by completing this now, that still goes in there. So what's new with demand reduction measures? And this is partly why I was hired, is there was a new law that went into effect January 2015 that all suppliers, all cities serving over 1,000 people must have demand reduction measures in place. Another way of saying water conservation, water efficiency. Um, and they cannot construct a new well without that. And completing this water supply plan fulfills their demand reduction measures. Um, so what exactly are demand reduction measures? We've kind of broken into four main categories. One is on the, the supply side is to reduce your water loss, your leakage and things like that. The second one is to reduce the water demand, how much people are wanting to use. And the third is to reduce the peak demand. Peak demand is your summertime use versus your wintertime use. And I don't know, Brian, are you going to be getting into that? That's a shocking thing in the metro area, the amount of water we use in the summer versus not we use in the winter and also to reduce uh, the non-essential use. We're not saying you can't still have a water park, but you know, be efficient about things. Um, so supply side, what do we mean by that? So in the water supply plan, we have eight main goals that we're trying to get the cities to achieve in the next 10 years. This first one for some cities is gonna be the hardest thing for them to do, um, is to reduce unaccounted for non-revenue water loss to less than 10%. 
Duluth was about a year or two ago at about 35 percent. So to get them down, because they have the pressure of the hills and forever break, I mean, they have like seven water main breaks a day almost up there. It's just insane because they have that big pressure there. So they're working on putting in some new pipes and some new work. But it's going to be really hard for Duluth to get down to 10 percent. But they might. Other cities are already down there, down to like 3 percent that have fairly new water systems and things like that. I would say, I don't have any statistics but from going around and talking to the cities, I would say 12 to 15 percent is pretty common for a lot of cities. But this is one of those things that it's just a waste of water to have these leaking pipes. Um, that in many cases, it's already treated. They've already gone to the cost and expense to treat the water. Welcome. Come on in. I know the traffic was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is one we're really encouraging cities to start working on. And it can be done by improving metering. Sometimes it's, if they have better meters, they can tell that they're having a leak and they can actually get automatic um, reporting now. Uh, calibration, doing water edit, audits, and leak detection and upgrading their water system. Um, Minnesota Rural Water will help uh, the rural communities, I think they'll even come in the metro sometimes, and help communities do uh, water audits. And there's also a lot of companies out there that do it as well. Uh, another one is to try and have the communities achieve less than 75 gallons per capita per day. Um, and again, some cities that's really easy. And it, it kind of depends a lot on if they have a lot of irrigation or not. For example, in Brainerd, they have their, it's an older community, they don't have hardly any irrigation. They're at 35 gallons per capita per day. But Baxter, which is right next door and, and has newer homes and more bigger lots and things like that, are well over the 75 gallons per day. So it kind of depends, but we're trying to get that number down. And again, in the metro area, it's a little bit high. Outstate, that's not as um, hard to achieve because they don't have as much irrigation. And then also to achieve 15% reduction in institutional, industrial, and commercial and agricultural water use. This is the one that the cities are a little bit, they're like, how do we do this? Um, but the soil and water conservation districts in the metro area are just now starting to work on some of this. They are taking this on as a project where they're going to particularly work with public campuses like schools and things to try and find ways to reduce the water use in these large facilities that may have acres and acres of irrigation for the ball fields. They may have hundreds of toilets, you know, thousands of sinks and things. So they're going to be trying to work on that. So we're asking the cities to meet with their top 10 water users and say, this isn't any kind of a mandate, it's just kind of an education thing, and we would like to work with you to figure out how can we reduce the water use. You're one of our top 10 water users, and in almost every community, schools are one of the top 10 water users. Now, there's going to be some places where that's not going to be real easy to do. Uh, for example, who was I talking to? Uh, oh, um, where's Westerman? Jim Westerman from? Woodbury. Woodbury. Woodbury said he went to, they went to 3M and said, we need to get do some work with them, and 3M said, nope, we got proprietary concerns here, we don't want to give you our water data. Now, you know, other than the total amount, they don't want to talk about where they're using water here and water there. So it's a little bit tricky, but we'd like them to try and start working with their big water use. There's one town out in western Minnesota where 85% of their water use goes to like a cattle confinement place. So, you know, with livestock, you got to give them water, but can you do anything with leak detection? Can you do anything with reusing the water to clean the, the floors and things like that? So, Demand side conservation. So another one of those is to achieve a decreasing trend in per capita demand. So in other words, in the metro area, we know the population is going to keep growing, and that's fine, but can your, your per capita demand stay the same or go down? So that's the main thing that we're looking at there. And then the fifth one is to reduce the peak day demand to less than 2.6 ratio. And Brian will probably be getting into more depth, again, having to do the summer use versus the winter use. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, there's all kinds of irrigation smart controllers that are out there to reduce water use by 30 to 50 percent, spray nozzles and things like that. So um, if you're interested in this irrigation stuff in particular, I would point you to what did you um, In the back of the room, there's a workshop coming up at the end of the month that's sponsored by Rainbird and the Department of Natural Resources helping to um, specifically on large-scale irrigation. It's not so much your lawn although it would probably be applicable too, but for these big campuses, parks, and things like that. So that's something I'd encourage you to sign up for. It should be a, a good conference, specifically on lawn irrigation. Turkey irrigation. Um, and then a couple of things in the water supply plan is that you must 
include a water conservation rate structure. And what that means is um, the more water you use, you don't get a discount. You're a big user, so we're going to give you a discount. And you either have to have a uniform rate or a conservation rate, which is like tiered. The more water you use, the more expensive it gets. Um, are you talking about that too? I'm not going to go into that. Okay. If you want to know more about that, Brian's really the expert. I know a little. Uh, so, or you can have a uniform rate with a conservation program. And this is something new from 10 years ago. One of the main reasons plans weren't approved 10 years ago is because they didn't have conservation rates. They didn't want to have conservation rates. And so they actually went to the legislature and got that changed. And I think League of Minnesota City might have been active in that. Um, it's before my time. But anyway, so you can have a uniform rate structure now, but you must have a conservation program. And so to make it easy for the, the city, by completing this water supply plan, they will have a water conservation program in place. One of the things is that if they don't, if they have a uniform rate, they have to do a few extra things <coughs> for promoting water conservation education. And stuff like that. So that's another good thing that come up. So other things are um, additional strategies that might be being in green step studies. It might be um, doing some reuse in their, their stormwater. There's all with a whole long list of things and they can come up with additional things of other strategies they have to conserve water. And then the last thing is we're going to be tracking the success in the next 10 years. And so that leads us to the next, the next piece. So why do we have water concerts? Why do we, why, we're a land of 10,000 lakes. Why on earth do we want to conserve water? Um, so um, one of the things is if we can't measure what we're doing, how can we improve it? So, we want to do water conservation in Minnesota because we do have some areas in the metro area and outstate, particularly in western Minnesota, where there is groundwater concern. About 75% of the water we use, drinking water we use in Minnesota, <coughs> is for from groundwater. And groundwater resources, although they're renewable, you can overtax them and cause them to be stressed and cause water levels to, to decline. And so that's one of the reasons we're wanting to, to do that. Um, and then the surface water, the 25% use the surface water, mostly that's in the Twin Cities here. St. Cloud uses the river water, and then Duluth and all the North Shore cities use Lake Superior. So the North Shore cities probably, I don't think we're going to have such a drought that the Lake Superior would dry up. But the river ones, <laughs> we could have a drought that could impact their resources. So it's just sort of a being prepared. Um, we haven't had a drought in Minnesota, a significant one for quite a long time. That doesn't mean it can't happen. So, um, just to kind of be prepared and to keep our resources in good shape and good quality uh, for future generations. Water use and the quantity does tie in with quality. I'm not going to get into all that today, but there is a good connection with those two. So by conserving water, you're also improving the quality in many areas. So what makes for the sustainable water future? Um, there's three, three key things. It's resiliency, efficiency, and quantity. The Department of Natural Resources really doesn't get into quality, quality, I said quantity. Quality, that's more PCA and Department of Health. We do get into some of the environmental effects, the surface water, uh, groundwater impacts. We do get into that a little bit for the most part, these are other agencies. So the DNR is primarily focusing on the efficiency and the resiliency. And other agencies are working on the efficiency as well. But um, making sure that cities, when they, Blaine, is anybody from Blaine here? When they ran out of water that first time, I was so impressed. I, I didn't know what all was going on, but I was so impressed at how quickly they were able to get water from a neighboring city and refill their water supply towers. So I, that was pretty impressive that they had that resiliency to quick figure out how to get water to the customers. Again, leakage and meter detection um, and promoting water use and continuity of coverages. If none of you have seen these purple pipes before, that has to do with, it means that it's a reuse system. That lets plumbers know these are not ordinary water pipes, these are reused water pipes. This was taken inside um, Lake Vermilion State Park. It went through the um, plumbing board to get approval to have reuse because they a bit of scarce groundwater resources. So um, one of our state parks is actually going to be having a reuse facility where they'll reuse the uh, um, shower water, how does that work? Shower water and toilet water, no actually the shower water will be reused to use the toilet. So I believe it's the main way. So um, what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about, and this is where I want to get some audience participation, is the new tracking or the reporting system that we're starting. 
We are partnering with EFP, the Energy Platform Company, that has for eight years been working with the you know, energy sector as well. So they're going to be helping us to develop this brand new, it literally just got approved Friday. You guys are the first group I've talked to about this program. Um, so uh, it, it provides baseline data, estimated savings, and acquisition information. And then long term, we're going to be doing some more savings accuracy and looking for patterns and creating some tools. So Leo, who was going to be here today, but some things came up and he couldn't, um, Leo has been 20 years and was working with the state of Minnesota to do conservation work. He's been working for eight years um, with the Minnesota Department of Commerce to do uh, their energy tracking. Has any, any of your communities do the energy tracking? Have your own energy source? Or, or you mean B3? You mean B3? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we feel like there's a lot of crossover between energy and water, and tracking something that isn't there is kind of a unique skill. And so we're going to build on what they have in their platforms they've created to do a similar program for the Department of Natural Resources and water conservation. Okay, I know you can't read this. I can't even read this. But um, so what we're going to be looking at. Um, this is, this is what the energy platform thing looks like for energy. But we're looking at, they're looking at different results from 2018, 2008, 2008 to 2015. You can compare it just with one screen. You can see how you're doing and look at things over time and figure out your planning. Um, the energy sector has to make plans, I think, every two or three years. It's a pretty short time, or five years. Integrated resource plans? I, I think so, that. yeah. Anyway, we're not going to have that planning component quite as much as they are. Ours are 10-year plans, so that it will, there will be ours will be basically easier and simpler than the energy sector. And there's 180 utilities in Minnesota, and there's only 360 cities that are initially going to be required to report. Um, and it's, again, it's a limited resource, like the energy sector. Um, so if you can't measure it, then you don't have any way of knowing if you're doing better or doing worse. So that's we just want to start keeping track of it because not really very few cities keep track of their own water use and how that's using. And the DNR does record total water use. Um, we know how many, much water each city uses, but we don't know what they're doing to do conservation. We don't have any way of measuring that. And there's a lot of excellent stories out there that we're just not capturing with the good work that's being done. Um, so this is one of the things to do that. But um, water conservation, unlike energy, has a lot less research available, although I say that, but there is still quite a bit. Um, and if any of you are interested, I just happened to see this magazine, the, pop the new issue of the Popular Science magazine. The entire issue is devoted to water. And I just started reading the first couple pages, but you might want to pick this up. It looks like it's pretty good. So, um, not that that's got the best resources, but I mean, it's one of the resources that's out there. Um, and there's not really good measures that are defined, and there's no annual reporting right now. So with the cities, you all do your annual water use reporting and through MPARS. So this will be sort of like a branch. I don't know if you remember, but in, when you do that reporting, there's a one-page thing on water conservation. We have no way of compiling that data. It's just like a separate PDF. So this way, we'll be able to compile it, compare it, track it. And it'll be a data portal, so you're just typing in numbers, mm -hmm. and they get stored in a Appreciate database. Right. And my, for those of you that are cities, my big picture long term project is in 10 years from now when you're doing your water supply plan again, you won't need to do a PDF document. You'll just enter it all right in here. So it'll be nice and easy. And then we compare, because right now we, have, we just have all these independent documents. We have no way of comparing them or totaling them or anything like that. So it's just not very, in this day and age, it's not very good data. <laughs> so this will be a lot easier. It's all based on the cloud. And we'll be able to manipulate it. Each city can say, well, I wonder how I do compared to this city. Or well, this city is similar to mine. I wonder what they're doing. And they can compare themselves. Um, it will be open to the general public, but you'll be able to see data from the other city. Um, and as I said, it'll be cloud-based. Hopefully it'll be really easy to use. It'll be rich in meaningful data. Um, hopefully a very minimal burden on the cities. It's probably stuff that they're probably keeping track of, but not reporting right now. Um, be real easy and intuitive to use. If I can really see this, I'm sorry. You'll put this together, but anyway. <laughs> um, and we're going to try and start tracking reuse. That's something that, if 
I know it's controversy. I don't know if we're going to get into it, but it's happening right over the Capitol today. I know yesterday there was a big thing on it about reuse and reporting. Um, but we want to report it from the perspective that reuse can really save a, a ton of water, gallons, millions of gallons of water. And so we want to keep track of the success of the reuse program. Some of the cities are doing incredible work. Hugo is doing some great work. What are some of the other cities? There's a okay. number of cities that are doing it. Woodbury is doing some, yeah. So there's some great reuse. And stormwater reuse is one of the, the easiest ones to do. Well, that's yeah. the city of St. Anthony St. Anthony, okay, thanks. Oh, right, yeah. So some of the things we'll be looking at is where, what source you're getting your water from, um, what environment you have that you're using with your metering systems and things like that, and your distribution and your delivery as well. And this is from Lakeville. I love this picture. It's a, well, some of the education and outreach. We're going to be kind of tracking that as well. We're also going to be tracking um, what um, ordinances that you have that can help promote water conservation in your city. Uh, so, and leak repair, replacement things, different things you've got. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to just get through that. So, that's that. So, what I would like you to do, did everybody get a chance to pick up one of these pieces of paper in the back, surveys? What I'd like to do now is to spend the next five minutes or so, just kind of brainstorming it, because this program has not been developed yet. And so, um, um, I'd like to bring it in with you guys. What are some concerns that you have with this? What you think would be a good thing for this? If there's specific topics that you're interested in, um, learning out more. Just sort of general thoughts on this water conservation track. Like I said, it was just proof Friday. We've done nothing yet. Uh, so, <laughs> so any ideas that you have would be great. Conversate, con yeah. Uh, ideas or thoughts? Yeah. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, but on the pricing structure mm -hmm. for conservation. So behavior is changed um, and largely incented through higher costs to use things. Okay. I mean, in theory. Yeah. In theory. <laughs> well, in, in studies, it's shown uh -huh. as well when we have a gas crisis or the price of gas goes up to four or five bucks a gallon, everybody's finding different ways to get to work. So, um, but I'm interested in hearing how, if you're providing, helping provide cities with any tools on how to look at their water pricing structure, and, and coupled with that also the sewer, because you look at disproportionately, um, a lot of cities are basing their uh, summer sewer charges based on their winter use. And if there was more of a, a time of year type of pricing like in the electric utility mm -hmm. where you're paying more for your um, demand when it occurs in the here in the Midwest in the summer, then you're going to find other ways for conservation. And I'm just, because that's an important tool of that, and I think cities have severely underpriced um, what that commodity is. Yes, and I think if there's one given, the price of water is going to be increasing throughout the nation and including in Minnesota. Just, just looking at the infrastructure repairs that need to be done in the next 10, 20 years, it's, they're just going to have to. It's, just, it's a lot of work that we have to almost start over again in some cities. So Brian and Meg Kelsa have done some excellent work on researching pricing and price structures, and I think we're going to talk about that again. But we do know that some cities and some price places, the pricing doesn't matter. Woodbury jacked their prices way up. They still, sometimes they, they will conserve for a few weeks, a few months, and then they go back to their old way. So pricing doesn't always do it. But Brian, you want to talk to you about the pricing stuff? Well, we have we just completed a, a regional water billing analysis uh, the past couple months that we worked on the CDM Smith so for the seven county metro area. All the, um, there's a lot of neat data in there. Um, there are a number of communities that do have uh, inclined block rate structures. Uh, in the metro area, I I don't know which ones. I don't know which of those utilities outside of Woodbury that has an inclined block rate structure also has what we call a water conservation. Just because it has it is an inclined block rate structure does not mean that it results in water conservation, right? Um, it depends on the difference in pricing between the tiers and how high the highest price and highest tier is. How many tiers there are? I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? 
Um, and on top of that, you know, here in Minnesota, we you know we have a lot of water, and it's relatively inexpensive to produce. Seventy-five percent of the state is uses groundwater as a source, and the quality is pretty high. So, for utilities, it doesn't cost that much to provide it compared to a surface water provider like St. Paul Campbell, which doesn't have a lot to produce. So, the cost is is low, right? Mm -hmm. And it's low because it's easy to get, and the treatment requirements are low. These are utilities that are providing it, and they're not businesses. They're there to provide. They provide a service. They're providing the water, which in this state is owned by everybody. The water of the state, which is all of us, to us. You know, it's just a privilege. So, um, so when one talks about it needs to be more expensive, uh, you know, what, what does that mean for utilities? How how, how would a utility, which is a nonprofit entity, public service, justify something? Investing back into their infrastructure. So you think, instead of putting uh, it in a, in a water fund and instead of making it to break even, it, I'm not saying it needs to be a profit center. I need to, I'm saying it needs to be a revolving water fund. Which the city of Rochester has probably done one of the best with the number of cities that are starting to do, but Rochester has had this going on for quite a long time where their top to make, to make break even as a nonprofit, but to pay their census, you only have to have all the cities on level, all the residences on level two. So anything they make from level three and level four, the extra money, they roll back into their water conservation program and they use it for rebates, for replacing toilets and sinks and things like that. They use it for educational activities and programs. So there is ways to do that. There is, I'm sure most of you cities are well aware of this, a law that, um, Cities cannot gouge their residences with their water prices. You can't make excess profits with your water. Um, but you can put it into your sort of saving for the future when we need to replace. We know we have to replace this water. We're saving up for that. You can do that. So it, it sounds like what you're saying is there are some municipalities that are not pricing the service high enough to provide for the funding for reinvestment in, in infrastructure. And right. so I would be very interested in knowing, and I don't know the answer to this, which ones those are, or ranking them, you know, on a scale to see which which utilities are well funded, which aren't. I don't know. Well, they're all pulling from the same aquifers for the most part, so it doesn't matter if one is doing it and not the other. I mean, it it it's a new point. It's not for it's not conserving. So it it's. Uh, it's a complicated it is. solution, but I'm just wondering what tools or information you're able to well, provide the city. Because I think that's an important component because nobody really, so they'll, oh, well, council approved a 2% or a 5% increase. Well, is that really capturing what they need to make those investments to get some of the septic systems off of, um, um, off of their septic systems that are 25 years old. It's not making sense to make that reinvestment and they're not putting away enough money and capturing enough money to be able to do that. No, I, I agree. The, the state can't tell the cities what to do with their rate structures. That's an independent thing and we don't want to go there. Um, so we assume the cities know the best. We do provide some tools on our, in the actual template. We have a whole page that sort of recommends what are some good things to consider when you're looking at your rates. Again, Minnesota Rural Waters will come out and do rate studies uh, with cities where they'll go through the books and look at the accounting and look at how much water they use, and they'll actually help uh, cities to do that. Other questions or comments? Okay, we, we ran a little short. I talked too long. It's my first time doing this, so I didn't know how long it takes. Um, so on that questionnaire, if you could uh, fill that out, this questionnaire, that would be great. Um, I, I'm looking for any feedback we can get at this point in time. The other things that I brought as handouts um, on the back is this is sort of an overview of the whole project if you want to know more about it, if you're not interested in all the details, uh, that fits in there. And then the workshop's coming up that we'll have some more information too. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Camilla. <laughs> so, so Carmelita, um, if you go on the Great Subsidies website to the um, step one through five, that page, and click on the step four and five metrics. We have, we've defined uh, metrics, and these are just the sort of sort of reporting that um, Carmelita is working on with Neo for this, this new system. So we've defined some metrics for step four uh, reporting, and Carmelita um, is the advisor for that. So we're, I mean, this is definitely an emerging area, and it's 
several several of these projects are sort of coalescing, so it's pretty crucial. Um, so I was going to mention, you know, every city is so different, and I was up in um, Pine City along 35W. We were looking at, at their industrial park, large opening, and we were thinking, well, if they had a large commercial, um, actually Pine River, just to be confusing, does have this. If you have a large commercial laundry, let's say, uh, a lot of water use, so that, that laundry is purchasing the water, which the city has spent money to, um, uh, to clean in the water plant. The, the laundry is purchasing it, use it, and they pay to just heat it, and then they pay to uh, dispose of it. So the question of sort of co-locating, and there were, there were two spots on either side of this, uh, uh, this location up at Pine River, we were thinking, you know, it could be, a, just a simple analysis could show people in the city that, wow, there could be tremendous benefits to the city in terms of uh, this water being reused at the laundry, such that the, the business, uh, you don't have a business a mile away that's purchasing a huge amount of water. You could have two businesses located that were reusing. So it sort of made the uh, community development director think, you know, hmm, you know, we have thought about, you know, maybe we're going to, were we going to have to drill another well? And I think Brian's going to talk about this. Wells are pretty darn expensive. So, uh, so that kind of thinking, depending on your city, there, there, these opportunities. That's part of the whole point of doing the water plant. And another example is over in Egan, where they have their water treatment facility down by the in the, by the Minnesota River and has to pump out groundwater in order to not get flooded. So they're trying to use that groundwater pumping to provide water for other Businesses in the area. Oh, right, right. Okay. Um, well, Brian, let me introduce you to come up. And um, so, Brian's uh, sort of the essential data person at the uh, Met Council, I feel like, for water conservation and has been in the newspaper favorably recently. So, tell um, us the, uh, the scene here in the metro area. All right. Good morning. I'm Brian Davis. Don't be afraid of all those. Letters that you see that a nerd wants to see that. <laughs> so, I'm going to be talking about water demand trends and irrigation here uh, in the metro area. Uh, I've been with the Metropolitan Council for almost seven years now, and I'm a hydrogeologist and environmental engineer with a broad water background. And lately, a lot of the work I do there has been in the area of water reuse, water chemistry, uh, irrigation efficiency conservation, things like that. So build and break structures. So a whole bunch of different things. Pretty fun job. So I just want to use this time to tell a story about the metro area um, and the water demand trends over time here. So what you see here uh, is the water use data for the seven county metro area during decades starting in the 40s and running through uh, just about 2010. The blue color is groundwater use, the green color is surface water use, and the gray is the sum of the two. So, the laser. Oh, the laser. I don't know. The laser doesn't seem to work. I don't know. The laser, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big stick. You know. So, the story here, of course, is early, early times on the graph. Populations dominated by the two large cities. The suburbs are just getting started here. The suburbs uh, in this area tend to use groundwater. The cities have surface water systems, Minneapolis and St. Paul, that they developed a long time ago. And of course, those cities also serve a couple of the inner ring suburbs right around their periphery. Uh, but over time, the suburbs grew, so groundwater use uh, in increased as a result. The total water use expanded because there are more people here now than there used to be, of course, millions more. And the surface water use declined a bit, partially uh, because of population decrease in large cities partially because of the industrialization and also because of the increased efficiency in appliances over time. In general, in the metro area, the residential water use is divided up into components, as you can see here, outdoor composing about a quarter. Now, when we're talking about, about the, the metropolitan area, 
when, when we talk about numbers that encompass all of the all of the municipalities, we're kind of doing a disservice to everyone because, as uh, Philip said, communities can be quite different from one another. Right. So some communities will have a lot more outdoor water use, and some will have less. Some have a lot more industrial use. Some have less. So when we look at a at a uh, at a picture of, of the entire metro area altogether, um, it's interesting. <coughs> Uh, I don't know if it's all that usual, but it is a good place to start. So I like to look at the components of the system and see how they're different from each other. So this is a graph of the monthly water use uh, in Lakeville starting in 1990 on the far left side of the graph and extending through December of 2015. So each of these vertical lines is a is the year, 90, 91, 92, 90. Um, so we can see, starting in 1990, when the population of Lakeville was about 25,000 people, uh, we had about this is here. Let me get one, two, three. So we are at about 50 billion gallons annually, is that right, for Lakeville. Um, and in the summer, we're going up to uh, double that amount. Right? So we have a peaking factor monthly from summer to winter for Lakeville of about two to one back here in 1990. Population in 2015 had gone up to about 60,000. And as you can see, the water use increased over time. This low number here, the, the bottom, the, the uh, lower numbers you see here are wintertime uses, and we can see that that is increasing over time as we go up into the uh, 2000s, up to 2015. Uh, but what's really interesting about this graph to me is that the summer peak goes up significantly relative to the winter use. Uh, if we go up into the, in the 2000s here, we can see some years where we're at you know, about four to one ratio of the summer monthly use to the winter monthly use, something that, that didn't happen before. So that's Lakeville. Woodbury is another growing community. 1990, about 20,000 people. In 2015, the population was up to about 67,000. So you see a similar pattern here of a ratio of summer to winter monthly use of about 2 to 1 back in the early 90s. And as you go forward in time, the base use increases, but the summertime use goes up significantly. So the ratio is going up again uh, for this community. And there are a number of other communities that have this type of pattern. So why is that? So what's different now about these communities versus then? Um, and I think the big driver in, these, in those communities and others like them is uh, lawn irrigation systems. There are a lot of in-ground lawn irrigation systems in these communities now. If we go back in time, and you know, I have to fall back on stories and anecdotes, because I wasn't really paying attention to the in 1990. And there isn't much data on things like this, how many irrigation systems exist around. If we go back in time, um, my, my theory is that there, were, there was a lot less of this going on in the 80s and the early 90s in these communities. There's been a change in technology, and there's been a change in behavior that's happened over the past 20 years uh, well, in a lot of aspects of life. Uh, but one of them is irrigation. Uh, I never, I, I didn't even see uh, a home irrigation system anywhere until I went out and visited some relatives out in California, a place where it gets very hot and dry in the summer. That was the first one I ever saw. And of course, it had an electromechanical switch on it that turned the spring and to set it that ran down. Um, these days, you don't need electromechanical switches, everything is digital. You can control them, uh, push button or from your phone. Sometimes even from you know any Wi-Fi enabled internet source, you could be far away from your home, turn it on, off, all kinds of things like that. So the technology has evolved, uh, and I think the behavior has to. People see these things; they're installed sometimes in developments uh, for people even own homes, and they come to expect them. Uh, and of course, these systems, like a lot of systems, like trying to dial in the system here when we started, they don't always work as intended. Uh, things break. Sometimes the pressure in the system is too high. That's the 
common if you ever see a, a sprinkler that's operating more like a misting system, and you see this pretty commonly, it means that there is no pressure of producing valve in the irrigation system, um, and the pressure is too high, and it's so serving as an irrigation system, but also as a water evaporator. <laughs> For the benefit of, um, but there it is. Broken sprinkler heads can happen. Uh, sometimes they're dramatic like that, but a lot of times they're not. They are broken, they're leaking low ground, and you won't find them unless you go out there and look for them and feel the soggy ground around that sprinkler head that, that occurs whenever the thing is on, which is usually, oftentimes, between 4 and 6 in the morning, so you probably won't be out there looking for that. And it may be 10 years of time that goes by before you find out that you have been leaking thousands of gallons of water into your lawn. Um, you know, maybe you suspected something because you have mushrooms growing in places. <laughs> it's very wet. Uh, you probably just run them over the lawn. Uh, and of course, sometimes we've all seen sprinkler systems that are going up. So, how about a community that's, uh, that's different? Here's one. Richfield population has increased just a tiny bit between 1990 and 2015. And look at their water use. Those summer to winter ratios uh, haven't changed a whole lot. And in fact, you see a slightly decreasing trend, I'd say, in the baseline water use from the 90s up through uh, and Newport is another one that is similar. It's a very small community uh, south of St. Paul. Population has uh, actually decreased a little bit. And summer winter ratios bounce around, but there's no real clear pattern here. There is a, a slight decreasing trend on the, on the baseline water use, partly because of population decrease. But so this is another example. There are a lot of communities like this where the population is relatively stable. But the water use is declining, and of course, why is that? We're we're conserving water without even really making an effort to conserve water. Appliances, dishwashers, uh, clothes washing machines, and toilets are more efficient now than they were 25 years ago. So the, nat the natural attrition of the appliances they break; they don't last forever. Uh, means that that summer that that indoor water use is going to decrease because that new dishwasher that you buy or clothes washing machine or toilet is probably going to be more efficient than the one you're replacing. Some of this is driven, um, at least for, for dishwashers and clothes washers, by energy efficiency uh, guidance with Energy Star appliances. You know, you're heating water to clean things, and if you use less water to clean it, then you use less energy. So you're saving energy, you're saving water. So, as I've gone through this, this data, I've, what I've learned is I need to really look at these communities on a case-by-case -case basis uh, when I'm thinking about conservation and efficiency. And that, you know, my own <coughs> thinking is that a blanket statement like you communities, you all need to conserve water, is not really true. Uh, for some communities, they don't because their, their population is stable and they need the revenue to maintain the utility that they have now. So water conservation for them, although it, it, there, there's a moral, maybe it depends on, on your values, you know, there's a moral imperative to conserve water because it's good. Um, not everyone's going to agree with that. Uh, values vary from person to person. Um, from a financial perspective, it's, it's a, a bad thing for some communities. You know, and personally, I wouldn't recommend it. So, but let's, let's look at, at where it, so how do we decide where it makes sense and where it doesn't? That's the question. Here's an example of a community that I won't name. Um, top graph. I have two different five-year periods here. The blue is the mid-90s, and the red is the late 2000s, of 2008 to 2012. And what this shows is the ratio of each of these months, January, February, March, April, to the minimum month, which is usually February. So in the mid-90s, the peak month in this community was about 1.7 times more than the minimum month in the late 2000s, it had climbed up to about 3.5 times the minimum month. So what this means in terms of water use, here's the, here's the water use in that community, monthly water use during those two five-year periods. The blue is mid-90s. You can see that 
slight peak right there. The red is the late 2000s, goes up real high, comes back down. So I just did some arithmetic and I took, I took their water use during this 2008 to 2012 period, the red, and I multiplied it by the old peaking ratio for each month instead of the new peaking ratio. And what that does is it cuts off that peak and brings it down while still accounting for the increase in population. So for this particular community, if you do that calculation, uh, you end up with about 700 million gallons of water per year being saved. So it's kind of like a back to the future kind of thing. If everybody in the community behaves now like they used to in terms of water use, then that would result in about 700 million gallons per year saved today, which is about 29% of their total water use. That's the equivalent to about three new wells. Those are 19,000 people, uh, about $2 million a well, capital cost, so that's $6 million saved in capital cost and the annual on and on those wells operation is about 600,000 a year. So that's every year you're saving them. So that's, you know, that's a lot of money to be saved. So now that makes, that, that calculation is going to make a lot of sense for a community that is going to be growing and adding at least 19,000 people in the next 30 years or something. And there are a number of communities in the metro area where that is true, or there are more people in that coming. So think about that. If, if a community could, could somehow uh, change its behavior, reduce its summertime water use, get the peaking factor down, that would result in needing fewer wells in the future to serve these new people who are moving in. So you end up with fewer wells for the same number of people that means that your revenue is going up, but your costs are lower, and that stabilizes the finances of the utility versus if you did it the other way. Okay? So where, where, do we, where should we focus these efforts? Well, we should focus it on communities that are growing, where that decrease in, uh, that increase in efficiency is going to result in less, a smaller need for new wells because of the increase in population. So, there are a couple ways of, of thinking about this. I did some more numbers crunching and I, I made this, I created this, this, uh, this number that takes into account a couple of different important factors for ranking communities on whether or not uh, water conservation makes financial sense for them, right? One of them, one of the factors is, well, what is their existing residential gallons per capita per day uh, number? So these are, this is from our Twin Cities, this regional water, or the, uh, the billing analysis that I talked about that we just finished a couple months ago. These are all the, the municipalities in the metro area for which we have enough data to do this, this number crunching. So we can see that the residential gallons per person per day value varies. Some, there's some communities where it's already very low, like we heard, right? And there's some where it's very high. The average is about 77 gallons per person per day. That's an average number, so some fall above it, some fall below it. The ones that have a higher residential gallons per person per day are the ones that probably should be focused on because um, that's most likely driven by uh, summertime water use, irrigation. That's one. Uh, how about another factor? Another factor would be what's the ratio of the peak months to the winter months in each of these communities? So here is that data for all those communities, this is average values for 2000 through 2015. So the peak month ratio to, to the winter month average is about 2.5. Some communities it's already very low, which is <coughs> good for them. Some it's very high. So we should be focusing on the ones that are high because of the, those are the ones that are using wild water. So those are, those are two factors. And the third one um, is, and I didn't show this one, is how many people are coming to that community. You know, they're, we're going to be adding like 900,000 more people in this metro area by 2040 versus, I think, 2010. Uh, they're not going to be equally distributed, I'm sure. So some communities are going to be growing a lot, and some communities are going to be growing a little, and maybe some won't be growing at all. Uh, so the third factor that plays into that is how many people are coming. So I did another math thing to, to uh, put a factor in there that takes into account how many people are coming to that community. The more that are coming, uh, the more it makes sense for the community to be efficient because that means that there are going to be more people that they can provide <coughs> revenue for the water system, right? So when I put all those three things together, I ranked uh, 
uh, all the municipalities, and I just picked out the top 20 uh, from my list here. In my this is my, you know my own crude method of doing this. Uh, I'm sure there are other ways of doing it, and I don't know if this is the best way or not. This is one way I've come up so far. So the higher the number, uh, the greater the the uh, greater the potential for I'd say financial savings and stability for a community by being more water efficient. So you can see uh, we have Maple Grove, Lakeville, Blaine, Woodbury, Shakopee, Eden Prairie, Brooklyn Park, Prior Lake, Rosemont, Hugo, Andover, Chanhassen, Apple Valley, Savage, Ramsey, Rogers, Cottage Grove, Carver, Waconia, and Lake Elmer are the top 20 on this list. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ones where it could make sense to be more water efficient. Um, but if you go down to the far end of this list, you'll end up with communities uh, like probably like Newport, which have very low numbers. Um, and for them, uh, being more water efficient is something that they need to be very careful about because they, the revenue is needed to maintain the system that exists. So I just wanted to get that thinking going with people here about how to focus this topic a bit on communities. It's, it's very easy to paint everything with a broad brush and say, you know, we should do this in communities, but really, I don't, I don't think that's true. We have, you know, over 100 municipal utilities in this metro area, and they're not all the same. Some of them, could, this can make a huge difference for them and make a lot of sense, save people a lot of money, and stabilize the finances of the utility. And some, that's not true at all. So we need to really think hard about where we're going to do this and why. Do a few questions before we move on to uh, okay. Well, um, so are we looking at like with energy doing decoupling because obviously you have to support the, the water infrastructure to supply it to people so that we're, de we're decoupling that cost to the price of water. I mean, because that I mean that's a given. It's, it, they have to be able to support their infrastructure and do whatever tiers or whatever beyond that? Is, is there that kind of decoupling going on? I don't know if you ever really decouple it. I mean, it's, I don't think it can be really decoupled. I mean, you have, moving water takes a lot of energy. Uh, it's heavy. And uh, treating water, of course, takes energy, too. So when, when you say decoupling... Okay, so that's the overhead cost of providing water. Yeah. I mean, your pipes, your whatever infrastructure you've got in order to deliver it to get it out of the ground. I just wondered if there was anything going on. Well, okay. Although the one thing I'm going to say is that there was a Normandale Community College Science Project that won second place in the nation for the energy water nexus category. And what they did is they invented a turbine, a hydrokinetic turbine system that would use the wastewater flow that would normally go after it's been treated and going back out to the river. They would use that pretty steady flow to power the, the wastewater treatment system, which I thought why doesn't everybody? Yeah, it's oh, it just makes such good sense. And it, I think it would provide about 75 to 100 dollars. And also, so I'm, I'm, I'm here from a watershed district, but also very much involved with Green Step Cities. My nonprofits encouraging our chapter areas to be Green Step Cities. But, so we've got two water reuse projects with Met Council. Mm -hmm. Riley Perkins, right about three blocks yeah. district. Um, one's a fire station reuse, and the other is like. Yeah. And then the other in Chanhassen, uh, <clears throat> I think it's a high school. Anyway, it's a uh, body field and so. But I know there are other other places that they're doing this. I'm also on the Bowser board, and we're seeing that being factored into water management plans. People are wanting to do that. They want to conserve water. They see that groundwater, surface water interaction. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm seeing that come through, um, people talking about those things. And I know DNR and health department's coming up with some permitting. So we're hoping that won't be a barrier. We hope it's an inclusive process so that, because some of our watershed districts have been trying to do water reuse mm -hmm. for a while. But, um, so the other thing I guess I was thinking, are there are there incentive programs like, maybe we could have a water thing <laughs> where people could get low flush, low flow toilets at a cheaper rate we could do some cost shares maybe, or, or just well, we, even drip irrigation systems to educate people more on that kind of stuff. Well, we one example is there's a program I manage, the Water Efficiency Grant Program. We have 19 communities in the metro area that are participating, okay. uh, where we fund at 75% the community, 25% retrofit replacements uh, with water sets, certified toilets, uh, landscape irrigation controllers, uh, irrigation audits. And energy star rated close washing. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. so we're doing 
that to the tune of half a million dollars over a two year period and the legislators right over there <laughs> decide on you know, whether or not it happens over the next the next biennium. Uh, so we'll see. So th yeah, there there is there's a little of that going on. Uh, there could be more. You know, another whole aspect of this that I that I, I can I think you're getting at is, you know, I was talking about the utility side drivers, and of course there's a whole other group of drivers for conservation that's related to um, surface water, groundwater interactions, lakes, wetlands, that's a poet, which is also critical and varied and can completely override that. <laughs> Ecologic, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, certain <coughs> cities I'm thinking of, Rogers, and Rogers actually used a Green Corps member for this. You know, Rogers just on their own, the city council decided that they had, I think it was seven industrial users, such high water users, that they simply, their economic development person, as part of their just standard uh, work being paid, went out to each of those seven and they looked at the irrigation, they looked at water reuse, uh, and that's something totally within the uh, 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 fixtures, so that's totally within the um, within the budget, the function, the purview of a, of a city. That's a man, so yeah. One of, I mean, it's like, no, it's really cool, and I, I know about this was happening before, because I've only been here for one or two years, but is that there's really swirling of people working together, and then there's the University of Minnesota MinCAT program, which Brian and I really promote hard with all the communities, where they will send an engineering a graduate student usually out or other students to city or to industries or cities. Yeah, usually industry. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, those students will try and find ways to save energy, waste, and um, water conservation. And they they have come up with some tremendous suggestions, like millions of gallons of water that these kids are coming up with. And all that the business has to do is pay for this intern at a very minimum wage. So. There's some really excellent stuff, Brian and I could rattle on for a really long time. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I think we're going we're gonna to bring on, uh, thank you, uh, applause for uh, Brian. For, uh, uh, so Kay from uh, Fridley is going to talk. Um, Craig Elrod from Waconia is not able to make it here today. He'd love to come to a, a, future, um, a future workshop. And obviously there's so much we can dive into. There are so many ways to segment. Uh, and parcel of this water, water conservation okay. reuse uh, area. So uh, Craig would love to come another time, but um, I think um, I think Kristen, yeah, from Woodbury can maybe make some comments after Kay speaks. Uh, comments about uh, reusing stormwater, uh, stormwater ponds for irrigation. So Woodbury has has done that. Um, yeah, is that possible? Let's say a few words. Okay. But first, let um, me introduce uh, Kay, who's going to talk about. Um, water, abuse, landscaping, and a number of elements. And, and Kay, I think it's good 15, yeah, 15 Keep minutes, 20 minutes, yeah. So. I bracket in between uh, scientific powerhouses here, so we're just going to dial it back down to the local city level for a little bit here. Uh, Fridley is a fully built out suburb. Oops, I'm not sorry. Uh, inner ring suburb that's just north of Minneapolis and uh, on the east side of. Mississippi River. I'm the environmental planner. Um, this just came out a couple of days ago. We've had 3,000 year floods since 2004. You know the rest of that story. Why we're doing some of this isn't just about the pumping of groundwater. Uh, this is a Fridley shot here. We're talking about landscaping and local efforts to save water. It's just not coming at the right time is another factor. Uh, as far as interspersing rains throughout the summer to be useful for gardens and for uh, lawn uh, turf production. So waterwise landscaping, obstacles in the development review process. Really, as all fully built out is redeveloping brownfield sites and increasing density per our Met Council and comprehensive plan process. So we want to make sure that our wells are not over capacity, that we have spare capacity for this redevelopment and that um, you know, as well, when the wells break down, that we are not uh, in, a, in a situation where we're in a world of hurt when that happens too, in terms of resiliency. Um, when we see bad plans that are not water sensitive plans being done by mysterious people, not, not landscape architects, not folks that know what plants need to make them, to make these landscapes as water efficient as possible. We're seeing old plants 
uh, selections that are not native or not drought tolerant, that are not being situated in, in a way that their root systems can grow and absorb water. And um, we're seeing a lot of mowed turf in areas where you think you don't need as much mowed turf. Corporate campuses, um, all sorts of developments. Turf is still the go-to thing, shallow rooted turf. Um, the grasses and the pollinators that are specified, almost none. People don't know how to take care of them. They don't know what to do with them. They know how to mow turf and sharpen more of like, <laughs> uh, Just a quick couple of things. Don't accept barberry and invasive species on the plants. That has nothing to do with water. It's just kind of a hobby horse. All right, <laughs> moving along. Um, but having the plants have variety within the genus and species of them to increase the likelihood that you're not going to have them destroyed by pests moving through, it also can help um, with you know water use that you use plants that are the best suited. Um, and what happens is, um, plant, it, it, it's not just pest resilient, uh, but creating enough space for trees to actually grow, uh, sometimes that's at odds with what city code is written for the number of lineal feet or square feet of a building and the number of trees that are required. You just plunk in trees and seven years later they're dead and we use a code enforcement procedure to go back and make them plant that same tree when we look it up and then that lives for a while, and then that's dead. That's a bad, bad model. And I'm not sitting up here to say that everything is, is going perfectly and friendly. Just some of the concerns that we have, some of the things that we're working on, and some of the things that we'd like to work on. Um, making trees grow properly in tree boxes. Tree boxes are expensive, but it's a good stormwater device. Um, so, you know, explaining that maybe your build-up can be bigger if you have more infiltration basins with native plants, more trees in tree boxes or in areas that can grow um, with engineered soil, that kind of thing. Uh, so increasing the diversity of the species is just part of it, but making sure what you do have grows. Final bigotry. Um, <laughs> I didn't invent that term, uh, but it's, it's, it's really true. How we've gotten into a pickle with uh, less diversity of species and um, down to just a few things that don't necessarily grow well or take a lot of water is because we don't like anything that's messy. It's a maintenance headache. So, um, so we don't want to avoid that. Um, what, what I see is turf and trees are the antithesis of working well and playing together. Um, when you plant trees, you put a bark ring, quickly the turf usurps that bark ring, and then you have trees trying to compete with turf and they don't like each other. And trees don't grow as well when they don't have bark rings. And you have to make sure that staff realizes too, um, whether it's park staff or public work staff or maintenance, professional maintenance staff, that bark rings need to be renewed. It's an important part of it because trees don't live when they have um, interactions with string trimmers and lawnmowers. We just did a, a, an inventory of all the, the trees in the city with a Green Corps person. Highly recommend that program. Um, and and found a surprisingly end up disappointing large amount of that. So decreasing turf. Why do we need this much lawn? Lawn is the reason that things are spiking so much for water use in these huge lawn areas. What are we doing with them? Are we playing, you know, a full game of baseball in, in, you know, in our yards? These corporate campuses uh, don't need that much lawn either, especially uh, water intensive areas like skinny lawn panels they cannot be used for recreational areas that are not used for any kind of, um, you know, unstructured play. It should be eliminated. Um, so we're in the same situation where we're looking at summer versus winter rates. You know, we need the money coming in from, you know, water. But um, at the same time, we want to look at, you know, what can we do and, and make sure that our city codes are not um, preventing us making progress with this. So if you look at this project, this is a redevelopment project I'm imagining along the Mississippi River. Oh, except for Merkur rules. I'd have to back it up a little bit, I'm thinking. But um, instead of just ordinary turf here, this is a combination of, you know, conceptual images of grasses and things. And I apologize to whoever slide this is because I couldn't find the attribution. But um, 
it, the opportunity to have interesting interaction with plants and to soften the landscape with non-traditional landscaping, so some people this looks really messy and certain times of the year maybe it is. So our image of what is beautiful in a landscape and or what we're willing to allow for development review when in fact we've codified X numbers of trees, maybe not even specified shrubs, and pollinators and forbs and grasses don't really have a role. We can't equivalent we can't create an equivocation, or not equivocation, an equivalent, I mean to say, um, for like how many of those ornamental grasses equals a tree in a cold situation. And they want to do maybe a development project wants to do as little as possible. This is the last thing in on the project. So anyway, uh, summer water use is higher for us. Maybe odd even isn't working everywhere. Um, we meet with schools and, and people that say we don't have the money to retool our irrigation. We, it's a 1960s system and we, um, we're busy making new parking drop-off areas so parents can bring their chubby little children to school instead of walking so we don't have any money to do that. <laughs> um, University of Minnesota Turf Professor Sam Bauer has got a great water saving strategies for home lawns that works for corporate excuse me, as well. It says pay attention to the weather. Select lawn grasses that use less water and can tolerate drought. There's all sorts of uh, turf mixes now that have a higher degree of fescue or higher amount percentage-wise of fescue, which is more drought tolerant. So if you have more bluegrass and perennial rye in the mix and less fescue, um, you automatically have a more water-grabbing type of lawn. Um, not even talking about low mow or no mow. Um, and and toad-wise, um, there's issues with that too. Um, Sam also talks about a half an inch of water a week or dampening the ground down to the uh, six inch level. In sandy soils, like a groundwater recharge like Fridley and some of the you notes know, of sand plain, that might have to be an inch if you really want to maintain turf. So the skinny lawn panels, do we need that much traditional lawn? That's a fescue mix in the front yard. I guarantee you, I was getting a code enforcement call about this lawn <laughs> from people that want a neat and tight. So there's also, I see as a boots on the ground person, a generational gap between those folks that grew up with manicured um, shrubs, you know, trimmed into balls and tuna cans and um, <laughs> very manicured turf as a control thing. It's neat, it's tidy. I get calls saying, my neighbor's yard is messy. And we have a 10 inch mow rule. If you don't keep your lawn mowed to 10 inches, we're going to come and do it for you. Well, that's probably, if it was standing up, 8 to 10 inches. So, you know, we've got a, some work to do in terms of education, but also in terms of the code. Because we also have people that don't want to mow their lawn, and they said, we, it's gone wild for us. Well, it's just on mowed bluegrass. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you better mow that one. So, um, But also cutting off only one third of the grass plant at a time in parks and not mowing it when it's dormant. All these kinds of things that are best management practices can be done. Um, and then the substitution gradually of plants that are suitable for dry for, and are more drought tolerant <coughs> is also very appropriate. If you can't keep, get people to go with the previous slide with the fescue, clump forming grasses that have an ornamental upright quality to them cannot be mistaken for unmowed turf. So you go with that because not everybody is, is going to know exactly. But in terms of corporate campuses, again, businesses, commercial settings, <coughs> parks that have skinny lawn panels, and why are we mowing those again? Um, these kinds of plants in big drifts that are native, that have uh, you know deep root systems and environmental utility beyond uh, you know, the uh, regionalism about them, could be good. There's more. Northland switchgrass panicum, um, globalist drop seed, also excellent on the edge of the thing. Um, but in communication with people in the community, um, what I try to say is, you know, put edging between your wilder area and your, if you have a small, very well maintained, but, but small lawn panel, um, so, so the neighbors know what you're doing, so we don't get a call saying, oh, so messy. But the other thing is, Urban food production is also coming into conflict with uh, traditional uh, profiles of, of uh, landscaping because 
if somebody, well, one time I think Penelope Hobhouse, a British garden designer, did a seminar in Madison and said, you Americans are so democratic, you, you are not using any of this lovely space in your front yard. I can shoot a cannon through, I'm paraphrasing, um, because it's all green lawns in the front. And I would be gardening and all that. And that was like 25 years ago I heard her speak. So we haven't changed all that much, but we're starting to. There are definitely pockets and suburbs and in, in, in neighborhoods in the big cities that are changing over to food, urban food production. Raspberries are a native plant. You don't pick them, the birds get them, that kind of thing. So, um, I touched a little bit on this, so I'll go through some of this a little more quickly. But using products for the life, life cycle of plants, you don't want to be pushing growth going into the hot part of the season. So, really, lawn fertilizer, and the university does this, is going to do this way better than I possibly could. There's some other uh, charts on the extension site, of course. But um, you might be fertilizing in August, September, and then you're doing your aerating, and so that you're, and you stop going when it goes dormant, and don't cave to the pressure of the neighbors who are keeping their lawn green. It's okay if you have a bluegrass or an ancient lawn that it goes dormant. Yes, the leaves pop out is green. Okay, maybe the ideas of beauty are shifting as well. Um, the main thing that I want to say about turf is everybody is cutting it too short. Public works, parks, professional maintenance companies, they're all cutting it too short. So, there's a tape measure, three and a half inches. You can let it go to four. Then only cut off one third of the grass plant at a time. And, you know, use three inches as the average, not the average, use about three and a half as the average, no shorter than three inches. Because then it doesn't go dormant as easily in the summer. You don't need to keep it, keep water on it to keep it looking green longer. That right there is a huge factor, absolutely huge. And thanks, uh, and then we'll for the photo. Water bags for trees to trickle soak. Nobody has the patience to sit and you know blow around water when there's a new tree, and there's gonna be a lot of new trees with emerald ash borer. Use hardwood shredded mulch. That's another huge thing I touched on earlier, but a surprising number of uh, regional park staff are not necessarily using bark. They're using Roundup. Um, sometimes on the edge, in, in areas that are heat stressed for turf, I, I touched on earlier, you know, a, a mixture of non invasive, uh, non natives, and natives might be appropriate. Rain garden, filtration basin, basin rather, uh, pollinators. You know, for a long time in landscaping in, in, the, in this whole area, we started to look like Kansas City or Iowa City or because the same palette of plant material was being used and the same bark or same stone mulch was being used. We didn't have any regionalism, any any kind of look like that. Um, we have a distinct, you know, areas of, of uh, specialty that makes us look like our part of the upper Midwest. And I think we should celebrate that. Also in terms of pollinators, these deep rooted plants don't need as much water. You need to time them so that they're valuable for the things they're trying to pollinate. And I know we're not talking about pollination and all that, but if we're going to plan for these kind of alternate landscapes and non-turf landscapes, that's just one other quick factor I want to touch on. And we needed some pretty pictures anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What are any what final thoughts from everyone else? Because this is just one little snapshot from one. I know that Prairie Restorations, which is a native plant provider and seed provider, has the goal to have all properties, have 25% of their property be native landscape, whether it's trees, wetlands, prairies. That's their business goal, which I think is just an amazing concept. Sure. Yeah, another question would be on, um, I'm a master water steward and we're reaching out to Businesses to talk to their landscaping contractors about especially winter salt use. Uh, but if there's also there's a winter salt certification, is there also a certification for like low water summer maintenance and like keeping grass clippings off of hard surfaces? Absolutely, that's an excellent point. Right now, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization uh, works uh, with Fortune 
uh, I think, 14, 14, yeah. And they have a sustainable turf uh, seminar, which I have gone through years years ago, and all of the public works folks at the city of Fridley have done to concrete watershed districts. So the water water management organizations have been very good, and this program is is great. Um, bring enough sub sandwiches so the guys are happy, the guys and gals that that uh, you know care for the landscape because the information is is pithy to the point and. They're continuing to run those summer and winter, both the salt and the runnable church. Um, it's the company is is it Fortran? Fortran. Fortran. Fortran Consulting. Fortran Consulting. And they have been working with Mississippi Watershed Management Organization is just one example, but I'm sure some of those things also could be done as webinars in in, in house. Um, that's an excellent um, way to make sure that you get consistency in training. But you do have to spot check too because we have gone through it. I'm still seeing turf getting mowed too short. So my ending message is anything is, you know, reduce turf, then care for it properly, and so that we can reduce the water input for it. Because if you, I'm guessing if we did some land mapping, we got a lot of corn, we got a lot of lawn, and so let's let's try to reduce the lawn. That's that's such an excellent point. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kay mentioned de uh, de ordinances and development review. Uh, we actually just put up under the model ordinances um, tab on the Green Subsidies website uh, some um, sample ordinance language that was developed uh, by uh, Green Sub consultant Michael Orange, who's worked with uh, Burnsville and Minneapolis. And it talks it really focuses on this, if you're going to plant it, if a city is going to, um, through its development review process, um, uh, sign off on a plan or, or the city is not planting trees, uh, it, the language is really oriented toward plant, it, plant a tree once so you don't have to come back yet. Typically seven, five to seven years, I can think of uh, you know, trees along Grand Avenue in Minneapolis, I've noticed that you know, about every five years, the poor tree, it just it's put in this little coffin. Um, so the dimensions and the uh, sort of metrics for how how can you um, can the city's zone trees and, and approving trees be planted uh, get a tree that's planted that actually is going to grow plant at once that actually will, will serve all that ecologic function in terms of uh, stormwater uh, cooling effect uh, and conserving water. So um, so that's a so that's a sample language is about just four or five pages. Per so um, uh, as, I, as I said, um, Craig was not able to come here, but but Kristen from Woodbury, did you have a few words about reusing stormwater pond water? I'm going to defer to Sharon. She is from okay, Woodbury. Yeah. She's also from Woodbury. Thank you. Yeah, before Ann. Uh, yeah. Sharon is an uh, environmental resources coordinator for the city of Woodbury. Um, just a couple of notes on some of the work that we have been doing recently in Woodbury. Right now we have five stormwater reuse irrigation uh, installations in the city that were initiated by the city. Um, four of those five are, are long-term um, maintenance responsibility of the city staff. Uh, we did approve uh, seven private systems um, on commercial and uh, larger scale residential developments within the last year or so. Uh, at this point, only two of them are up and functioning, like started last fall, uh, making sure that the systems were working. Uh, five of them were just approved last year, so uh, some of the projects aren't even graded yet, so we, we have yet to see how the installation and the actual operation of the systems work in those locations. Um, in, I believe, December or the beginning of January, the city of Woodbury unfortunately uh, issued a temporary ban on the uh, any new development applications, including uh, stormwater reuse as part of their stormwater management goals uh, and to help us achieve our water conservation goals, uh, which was alluded to earlier. We had some concerns with where the uh, Department of Natural Resources was headed with um, the general permit for appropriations that they had released for comment to cities at that time. Uh, I believe we have worked very closely with the DNR staff uh, 
and expressed our concerns actually in this very room not that long ago. Uh, and I believe that they have heard our concerns, they're working on it. Um, the other half of that is we also have concerns with um, the Department of Health has been looking through the interagency reuse team uh, and probably will touch on um, at the health risk of these systems and uh, basically spraying stormwater into the air and if there is a health risk for that. Uh, the interagency reuse team, the goal is to have that health risk assessment in two times that they've been monitoring for a while out by July this year is what I've heard. Uh, to determine if some kind of additional treatment is required on these systems. Uh, that would probably be uh, microfiltration and UV light treatment. Uh, based on our conversations with um, some of the landscape <coughs> designers, irrigation consultants that do work frequently in the city, uh, it does add a hefty price tag to the system as well as being a component of the system that uh, requires annual inspection and replacement parts things that we're not sure um, our HOAs are capable of uh, or our commercial development, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so we don't want to see uh, requirements that we don't think are, are actually feasible in the field. Uh, so we're kind of waiting to see what the health risk assessment says and if there is indeed, uh, the state believes that there is a health risk to these systems and that they actually have uh, the additional treatment requirements for stormwater reuse irrigation, uh, we will take a step back as a city and determine if we want those systems installed in the city. Uh, and if we take um, that approach, we will just go back to uh, standard stormwater treatment mechanisms, uh, which don't always work on small sites looking for areas for infiltration basins. doesn't always work on commercial areas, and we don't get the added benefit of water do think that um, the added treatment requirements will be a significant expense and a significant long-term maintenance aspect that uh, our commercial development and homeowners just aren't capable of, of following through on. So that's kind of where we're at. And maybe Kristen wants to talk about our school programs that she's <laughs> heading up. <laughs> and then for conservation, we are. Um, just rolling out an efficiency program to do cost share with anyone who has a separate meter for their irrigation system. So most of our HOAs have that and large commercial facilities that irrigate their landscape um, do 50% cost share up to a certain amount. And this is a multi-year program funded through uh, their rates specifically um, to help do efficiency at that level at a larger scale, and then looking to future years of doing more residential homeowner scales. And we've done a couple pilot programs with MNTAP and um, are working on our own system through the Met Council grant also, just to do efficiency everywhere on irrigation. Have you run across HOAs that you know pro insist on just turf grass? I mean, I know that is a some yeah, we just had uh, a meeting <laughs> last night, um, and that was one of the questions uh, raised by uh, one of the residents that was in attendance. And to be honest, I haven't ever looked at HOA bylaws that specifically. Uh, the city does have a very specific ordinance that does allow um, native planting. Native, yeah. yeah. Um, but that does not mean that the HOA can't write into their bylaws that. It has to be turf, um, you know, and I, I guess I, I've looked at HOA bylaws for other things, but not specifically uh, related to if there is specific species that you can have as your lawn. Sure. And sure, for your comp plan for Woodbury, are you guys looking at the water conservation or like climate adaptation or energy goals, like making it in a comp plan too? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, so that's what's very, uh, you know, that, and just thinking about reuse of, of stormwater, uh, Brian mentioned uh, St. Anthony Park. St. Anthony Park, um, it, or village, village, they're taking, yeah, village, city of St. Anthony, is taking some of their um, uh, stormwater for irrigation, but they're also taking backwash from their water treatment plant. And I, I don't know what component, but I think in total it's 7 million gallons a year that they're using to irrigate there. And I think it's a municipal park next door to a stormwater pond and their water. <coughs> so 
that's another technique uh, we're using back backwash. Kristen might know a little more about this because she was a green corn. Oh, you were there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you were there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they take it off the parking lot, the yeah. surrounding parking lot. streets, and then it goes to your gate. I think half the Central Park still but what lives in St. Anthonyville. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's, I think that was like the first system in the state or something, and they just had cleaned really? it out last year where they drained the whole thing and then took a back the truck to clean up. The oh, the to, oh, so keeping that part of that sort of cleanliness of the storm, storm water. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Uh, before Ann Gilman talks, are there any other cities who have uh, a water conservation project or success or issue you want to, or reuse? Any um, before Ann speaks here? Obviously, when you go to the Green Step website, you know, click in action and then click on the Who's Doing It tab. And some cities have a lot of detail uh, uh, under a particular um, uh, action, and you can figure out those 18 actions in Green Step. So that's obviously one way to to read, you know, sort of the diversity of how cities, uh, depending on their particular mix of uh, business, residences, institutions, uh, capacities, uh, projects they're doing. So just letting people know in May, if your city is working on getting these ideas in your comprehensive plan, it's underneath the resilience area. We'll be getting cities together by county in May again to share whatever they're coming up with on energy and adaptation so that you don't have to write it all yourself. You can maybe cut and paste ideas from other cities. Yeah, we're in this obviously unique ten-year window where, um, or two-year window where, in your comp plan, you can put enabling uh, language that, that gets worked out through um, uh, codes and ordinances and, and, and projects programs. So the yellow flyers are on the table about that. Okay, thanks. What's Tom. the actual date of the meeting? Uh, well, we're doing it like we're kind of trying to find a host city in each county. So, like we love Maplewood to like host it to the Marin County cities and certainly be pretty you know some cities so. Well. Good All right, thank you. So, uh, Ann Gilden, our uh, final speaker. Uh, Sorry, just a quick comment from the webinar. Um, another example are some humorous water conservation videos from Edina. Oh, yeah. Ah. From water conservation videos from Edina. So, one could go on the Edina website and find them. Fascinating. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, so let me introduce Ann Gelvin, who's the best practice advisor in Green Step for stormwater. Uh, she led a intense, easily three-year uh, project with uh, scientists and uh, uh, developers and um, government folks to develop the minimal impact design standard. Um, and she's going to talk about uh, that work is roped into the um, the wiki-based uh, stormwater manual that the MPCA has. So. Um, and can you help? So. Thank you. All right. Uh, switching gears a little bit to, to reuse. Um, how many of you have been to this page in our new uh, stormwater manual? You? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some some people haven't. That's that's good. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with our stormwater manual, and in particular. Uh, with the reuse section of the stormwater manual. So um, a few years ago, we started this wiki-based wiki based format of the stormwater manual. It used to be in a three-ring binder. And now it's in a media wiki version run by the MPCA. So we can change things like immediately. It's not this you know, long process of going through an update and putting things in a three-ring binder any longer. It's all like real-time, new, current information. And uh, we recently did a number of uh, updates in the stormwater manual, um, infiltration, pretreatment, and harvest and use, reuse was one of them. We had a, a long effort with um, a technical team, and Brian was on our tech team, and he contributed greatly. We used a lot of the information from the Met Council's uh, reuse guide um, in our new guidance for harvest and use. Uh, we hired a consultant EOR to do a lot of the work for us, and then the tech team members reviewed it and commented on it, and eventually um, Sharon too was on the tech team. Thanks for your work. Um, eventually, we um, put everything into the stormwater manual. 
I'm not going to go through each piece here because it would be hard for me to do because I can't control the mouse, so I'm going to rely on you. But if you just Google Minnesota Stormwater Manual, um, Rainwater Harvest and Use Reuse, it'll come up for you, or you can go to our website too. But the, our wiki, our stormwater manual is, is not actually on our website, it's separate from the MPCA website. So here you can see, um, I, I just put a box here for kind of an information box about that interagency reuse team that Sharon was alluding to. Um, there's a lot going on with that team. They have a great project website. And if you go to this page, you can click on the red, or excuse me, the blue um, project website. You can go there and get a lot of information on what they're currently doing. They've got a report coming out in July, but there's a lot going on there. Um, so here's what's in this section of stormwater and rainwater harvest and use. You could, can you scroll down just a little bit? Okay, perfect. Okay, so we have an overview. We have design criteria, construction specifications, operation and maintenance. There's checklists that we've developed, uh, water quality considerations, environmental concerns. We have some information on cost-benefit considerations. We even have some case studies um, calculating credits for stormwater and rainwater harvest and use. I'd like to add that we recently updated our minimal impact design standards, our MIDS calculator to include harvest and use. And we're having a webinar on that um, on March 15th at 1.30 p.m. So I'm going to be sending out a notice that you'll all probably receive here in the next day or two. But um, we're really excited that now our MIDS calculator does have that component to it. And we'll be demonstrating how to use that. Uh, we have some definitions, um, requirements, references, technical support. So anything and everything you want to know, current information on harvest and use is, for Minnesota, is in this manual, and it's really, really, really cool. If you could click on case studies for me. Um, this is an area that's under development, and we're looking for more and more examples. Um, right now, I have an example for the Mississippi WMO for their cistern that they have there, and um, kind of an overview of where it's located, who owns it, who the contractors were, who, op who operates the system, that's really important. What the costs were, and then if you continue to scroll down, a couple pictures there, kind of the type and the size of the system, when it was completed, why they did it, who funded it, uh, what they're monitoring for, their link there for more information, and lessons learned, and then contact information. So this is kind of the format that I'm, I'm going to be doing for other systems um, that we have in Minnesota, and there are a lot of them. I did a survey about a year and a half ago. Well, um, I probably talked to many of you um, about your reuse systems, and there are more than, than you realize in Minnesota. Um, if you could scroll down just a little bit, um, this is kind of some uh, older data that I had previous to this new um, information that we put into the manual, but um, I have I have it broke out by outdoor use and indoor use, and there's not a lot of content here, but hopefully in the future I'll be I'll be taking each one of these and developing a case study for each one. But there's the city of St. Anthony Village the um, Onaka Ridge Golf Course in Hugo, Target Field, the uh, golf courses in Woodbury, National Guard Facility in, in Arden Hills. So what I've done is just kind of given you just a little bit of information with a, a website to go to. But like I said, in the future, I hope to develop these case studies similar to the one that I did for Mississippi WMO. You can scroll down a little bit and we can take a look at some of these other ones. Maplewood Mall, um, Carver County, City of Cottage Grove, Lakeville, Edison High School, the Upper Villa Park in Roseville, um, with Capital Region Watershed District. 
some indoor use with the Lower Town Ballpark, Great River Energy, Target Field Station, City of Shore Views, Maintenance Facility, and so forth. So again, these will be further developed and we're always looking for more case studies on harvest and use. So that's a lot of information. I just suggest suggest that you <clears throat> go here and just you know dig into it. We recently did a webinar on harvest and use, and um, that we recorded it, and the recording will be posted um, in our stormwater manual here in the next week or so. And all the presentations that were given um, at that webinar are also posted in the stormwater manual. So. Um, any questions for Anne? Uh, any questions from the webinar? I just wanted to put in a, a plug um, before you all leave for Minnesota Green Corps. The host site applications are due March 17th. We've had some great people in Green Corps. We've had some great host sites. And if you're thinking about being a host site, please, you can talk to me on the um, topic lead for stormwater. Um, be glad to answer any questions that you have on being a host site. So, a plug for that too. Yeah, and we always have at least six out of 40 Green <coughs> Corps members. They serve in at least, you, this year I think 10 cities. Um, most of them, Green Step cities, are close to Green Corps. That's an example from the past. So. Um, um, yeah, because Green Corps and Green Step work pretty closely together. Um, this is a good year to apply. We are actually a little worried about future years, 2018, 2019, um, in terms of funding because we use federal AmeriCorps money for much of much of the 40 member funds. So this would be a good year, March 17th, I think. March 17th. Uh, link on the news box on the Green Step homepage uh, for applying for Green Corps. Right. Well, thank you, Anne. Okay. So, as I said, April 5th is our next um, uh, workshop on parks and trails. Look for the agenda, and we, I mean, we're get it out in various ways, but it's it's always on the news box on the. So, unless there are any further comments, questions, don't forget to take some fruit, coffee, head out to the back. Um, Thanks again to um, Johnson Controls and to um, McKnight Foundation for helping with these workshops. And of course, the LMC hosting, uh, Danielle. Um, all right. Well, we are adjourned. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.